I am grateful in so many ways to be able to continue pastoring this church. One of the things that hit me just right now, that we take a pretty large chunk of our Sunday morning worship service for prayer. We take time to share prayer requests. We take time to pray corporately together. I'm so grateful for that. Nothing of any eternal weight, any measure that will bring glory to God whatsoever will be accomplished unless it's through prayer. And to, to just run into this new year praying, let's not take our foot off the gas. Oh, everything, every thought. There's times when the Lord has, has blessed me with this mindset. Lord, just today, let every thought, even just every thought, be taken captivity. Let that be a prayer to you. Let my thoughts be prayers to you. Oh, let's be a praying people always. Oh, praise the Lord. It is a new year. Happy New Year. I told Selena when I got back from church last year, I said, I forgot to, to talk about this is the end of the year. I just went, bam, I just went into the sermon. But it is a new year. It is a new calendar change. You ever wondered, though, what really is new in a year? Yes, the calendar changes, but it changes in the exact same way it changed this day last year and every year. It's the same calendar change, just a different digit. The seasons change. We're in winter right now, but we know spring's coming, summer, fall. And then winter again. The seasons are going to change in this year, but is it really new? It, I hate to break this to you, but it is now officially election season. It's an election year. All the ads are going to be crammed down our throats. All the bickering and the he said this, she did that. We're going to see this year some new faces in government offices from local offices all the way up. To the highest level, we don't know what faces, who we're going to see. But it's still politics as usual, if it's in the realm of men. What is really going to be new this year? Well, in God's kingdom, everything is new. Everything in God's kingdom is new, and it represents his work of creation. That God is Right now, creating. God just didn't just speak the world into existence, create the world, spin it on its axis, and then stop his work of creation. He is creating right now in this very moment. God, his glory is seen through his ongoing work of creation. And as we looked at Wednesday night, Don led us in a great end of the year, actually, excuse me, beginning of the year, Wednesday, Look at, we looked at these two verses, I'm just going to, this isn't our, our sermon today, but it sure goes along with where we're headed, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, all things have passed away, behold, all things have become new, if anyone is in Christ, Guess what? They are a new creation. Why? Because old things have passed away, and God makes all things new. And the second text we looked at on Wednesday, Revelation 21, then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. I make everything new. If you put anything in God's hands, any turmoil, any suffering, any disagreement, any struggle, any addiction, whatever you put in God's hands, all things pass away. Behold, all things become new. And there is nothing that God's creative power and might cannot redeem, restore. And the word that we're going to dwell on this morning the most is revive. God's Work in his kingdom, his newness in his work, 
speaks of revival. And I'm not specifically speaking of how we normally think of that word revival, at least in church circles, though it definitely applies to that. I don't just mean, hey, we're having a revival. The church is just on fire. We all want, we all, I hope, pray for a spiritual revival. But I mean, just at its basic level, everything God does is about revival. Our text today is from Habakkuk chapter 3. If you turn to that, we'll have it on the screen. Just, well, just a couple more things on, on newness. God's word says that his mercies are new every morning. Isn't that awesome? His mercies are new every morning. That means that there is a deeper level of his mer mercy to be experienced today than yesterday. Is that because his mercy was not as much yesterday as it is today? No. It means I have another day to further experience his mercy. I tell this to my wife of 25 years now. I love her more today than I did yesterday. Not because I didn't love her to my fullest yesterday, but I've got another day with the love of my life that God has blessed me with, and I love her more now. To borrow, to, I mean, to make this a spiritual lesson, that thought, I borrow the words of a hymn, every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Another day is another day closer to seeing Jesus face to face. His mercies are new every morning. Therefore, our love for him should be new every morning. We have more opportunity to love him, more opportunity to experience his love for us with each new moment. Well, the book of Habakkuk, the prophet, it's a very short book, but the prophet opens up the book with two heart-churning gut-wrenching questions and he is wrestling with justice. He is wrestling with what seems to be God not doing what it seems God should be doing. The righteous are suffering. The wicked are prevailing. The righteous are failing to do what they're supposed to do. But God, where are you? What, what is really happening, Lord? I look around this world is, is just falling apart. And God tells the prophet, it's going to get worse. And judgment is coming upon my people. Habakkuk just lets it all out. God, why? Why is it like this? And then he steps back. And he said, all right, I'm going to put my hand over my mouth. I'm going to be quiet now. Because I know I got something wrong. I'm going to listen. Will you correct me? Lord, I've expressed my... Hurt. I've expressed my questions, but I know I don't understand all. Give to me true revelation. Wisdom only comes from above. And he yields to the Lord's wisdom. And he hears the Lord speak. And then we pick up in chapter 3. Let me just read. I only have verse 2, but I'm going to read verse 1 there. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, on Shigunoth. This word Shigunoth, this is a, we believe, is a type of, of a, kind of a mournful, solemn song. Something, uh, it's, a, it's a musical term. And these, this is a prayer that was sung to God, to this tune, to this mood. And the prophet prays, O oh Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known in wrath, remember mercy. Revive your work in the midst of the years. Do you see the exclamation mark at the end of that verse? Revive your work, Lord, in the midst of the years. There's an urgency by this prophet, the same prophet that was just crying out, why God, why are, why are things like this? Why are the wicked prevailing? Why? 
he hints. He knows God is on the throne. And here, seeing what God has said, he's heard. And he says, Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. This is a burning passion. And I will say, I challenge every one of us today. This is to be our New Year resolution. Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. We're going to chew on that phrase all the rest of our time here. But let's start out with the very first phrase of chapter, of verse 2. Oh, Lord, I have heard your speech. You can't pray a prayer like this unless you first hear the Lord speak. Can you say this? Can you say you've heard the Lord speak to you? Or is that some kind of weird concept and a category you reserve for people who are just kind of not all there when they say the Lord you know, revealed this to me, the Lord spoke to me. Can you say that you have heard God speak to you? Scripture tells us that God is continually calling out to you and me. God calls out to the sons of men just from nature alone. God is always calling out to us. From the very beginning, after mankind sinned, God said, Adam, where are you? Right away, God called out, oh man, where are you? Where have you gone? Why have you turned from me? And the message of the entire word of God is always come. Let's reason together. Come. I can, I will redeem you if you believe and confess and receive my salvation. Have you heard God speak to you? If your heart has been gripped by his spoken truth, if you've heard a sermon and, or a speaker, you've gone to a rally, whatever, you've heard God's word spoken and your heart just <gasps> is gripped, then you have heard God speaking to you. If you've ever felt a shaking in your bones upon reading the word of God or hearing someone else speak it around you, God has spoken to you. If you see yourself, if you ever hear the word of God and you say, wow, that's me. And you, as if you're looking into a mirror when you see the word of God, guess what? God has just spoken to you. God is speaking to us at all times. Have you heard him? The prophet says, I have heard you. I get it, God. You have made your will known. You have made your truth known. Oh, Lord, I have heard you. And then he adds, and I was afraid. Why? Why is he afraid? Oh, because he's dealing with knowledge too wonderful, too great for him to fully understand. When Jesus spoke in parables, he was taking infinitely majestic truths, spiritual truths, that our brain could not fully understand or our eyes even begin to see, but he put them in physical stories and physical object lessons so that we could understand the basic principles of them. But they're so far beyond us. The prophet hears God's word and he's afraid. He's afraid because the word was judgment is coming against my people. He's afraid because he just heard God speak. Who am I that God would speak to me? The Almighty takes notice of me. You know, fear, the fear of the Lord is always the beginning of wisdom. That's where true wisdom begins. If you have no fear of God, don't even think to cry out for wisdom. Have you heard God speak? He speaks. And as he speaks, if we are not willing to hear his voice, we cannot expect him to hear our voice. And I borrowed that from Spurgeon. I like that. Hear that again. If we are not willing to hear his voice, we cannot expect him to hear our voice. Let's hear the word of God today further. We're just going to we're going to highlight certain words in this next slide. Revive your work in the midst of the years. What a powerful word word revive. This speaks of new life. 
This speaks of, again, like I said, creation. God speaks. And this trial is, re is resolved. God speaks. And this demon is cast out. God speaks. And the dead are raised. God is always creating, always renewing, reviving. Revive your work in the midst of the years. This is renewal, restoration, redemption. The work of God is always about revival. But within the hearts of individuals, within the hearts of an assembly of individuals, even though this is always the work of God, the work of God can be hindered, can't it? Through laziness or spiritual apathy. Or through fear of the enemy. Look at all that is going on around the world and in this country, persecuting those who stand for the truth. Out of fear, people refuse to let God's revival take place. Or a love for God that grows cold. That certainly hinders the work of God. And nothing, nothing hinders the work of God more than sin. When we rebel and turn from his known truth and fall into sin. But God's work is, I am here to revive you. And the prophet, after hearing what's coming, he says, Lord, revive your work. That's the next slide. God says, clear out. Just like a doctor says, clear. He takes the defibrillator paddles and goes. <laughs> God says, it's time for revival among my people. Clear. And the, the prophet hears that. Do you hear it? Do I hear it for you and me? The next one, revive your this, I believe, is the key to the entire prayer here. Lord, revive your work. Whatever we have on our docket to accomplish in our lifetime, in this new year, today, whatever's on our plate to do, guess what? It's not about our work. It, it is always about his work. And if it's not, we're not in the will of God. We totally, we totally blown it. We totally missed it. Revive your work in the midst of the years. What could possibly be worth our time, our short time on this earth? What could possibly be worth our time if it's not about God's work? Too many times we pray, Lord, revive my work. Lord, these are the things that I'm trying to do and, and, and I'm struggling. Lord, just Help me to do them better. Revive my work. And you know, a good heart, a loving heart given to God can be misguided and pray this prayer. Revive my work. Prosper my work in the midst of my years. Do you see the problem with that? Me. But if you pray, revive your work, me disappears. Except for you're joining into the work of God. The work of God is always going. The church of the living God will always march on, will always advance. There is always a remnant that loves the Lord Jesus. And his work is always going on, even in the darkest of places where it seems like the gospel has no hope. The gospel is advancing. Lives are being saved. God's work always goes on. And the prophet says, Lord, revive your work. This is all about you. As a pastor, I can be tempted to pray, Lord, revive Seabird Chapel's work. We got a lot of work to do. We have a business meeting coming up at the end of the year. Guess what? It's not our business. It's the Lord's business. And we need to be revived as a group in the Lord's business, not in our business, not in our plans, not in our programs. As a pastor, I could be totally wrong in trying to revive what we are doing rather than to let God revive us with what he's doing. Lord, revive your work in the 
this for the year. A lot of people, a lot of individuals crying out for salvation are praying this prayer wrongly. They're saying, Lord, revive me. Revive what's wrong in me. But the prayer of a repentant heart is, Lord, I need your work, not mine. I don't need anything in me to be revived. I need to die. Salvation doesn't come except through death to self. The revival is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We die in Christ. When he died, he died in our place. And when we confess our sins, we die with him. When he was resurrected, that is our revival. That is our newness of life. That's what God does. He is always creating new. And we are a new creature, new creation in him. And so to pray this prayer that Habakkuk prays, it's about God's work, always about God's work. If you're about your work, if you're about your work, if I'm about my work, forget it. I don't care how good you think your work is, but my work is God's work. If it's your work, it's not God's work. If your fingerprints are on it in any way, it's not the work of God. It's not by power. It's not by anything that we do. It's by the Spirit of God, His power, His work. Last week, we talked about building the temple, that the Lord is going to build His temple. The, the call to Zerubbabel and, and Joshua, rebuild the temple. And God said, we looked at this verse, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. The silver, the gold, the plaster, the wood, the carpet, it's all mine, God says. I build my temple. It's for us to say, Lord, revive your work. And then... Before I go to the next slide, what is the work of God? I'm talk, we've been talking about the work, the work, the work of God. What is the work of God? They asked Jesus, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. The work of God is that you believe in him. That's God's work. The work of God is to drive the hearts of men away from their sinful unbelief to a full and complete surrendered belief in him, in his son, Jesus Christ, unto salvation. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's the work of God. He's come to set the captives free, to open the prison to those who are, are captives to, to, for the bonds to fall off, the chains to fall off, to heal the sick, to deliver the addicted, to redeem man, to restore man, to revive mankind. This is the work of God. And so when you say revive your work, then you are praying, Lord, get me in line with the revival of hearts. And let my heart hearts be revived in this purpose what is the work of God people Ephesians 2 10 for we are his workmanship we are the work of God we are his workmanship and then this word created speaking of newness created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them that's the work of God, mankind, and mankind being saved, redeemed, restored, revived, alive from the dead. This is God's work, so it has to be our work. Jesus told the parable of the master and his stewards. He gave talents to his servants, and he said, now you go use the talents I had given you, use the money, use the resources, and advance my kingdom, advance my profit. And this is Matthew 25, 20. So he, 
So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Well done, because you advanced my work. Good job. That's exactly why I hired you. But the one servant who rejected his master's work and focused on his work, he dug a hole and buried his master's talent. And he was cast out for there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. It is the Lord's work. Therefore, revive your work, will you? The third one, next slide. Revive your work in the midst of the years. This, this is where the urgency, this is where, this is where it gets exciting. Once we realize God is working, once we realize that God wants to work in me and you, in this church, in this town, in this world, once we understand that, I've heard your speech, Lord, and I'm afraid. Therefore, revive your work. Once we do that, now it comes to, and do it now, in the midst of these years. Right now, it's not revive your work at the end of the years. Oh, I can't wait for when I see him, when this world is all burned up, with no more suffering. Revive your work so that one day we'll be with you. No. Oh, but yes, <laughs> praise God, that, that is what waits, our eternal reward for those who are faithful to him. But it starts now, revive your work in me, in the midst of the years, right now. In these years, I think of Esther when I see that. Esther wanted to see the revival of the people of God. They were being persecuted, but she didn't see how it applied to her. Definitely not in her time, in her circumstances. And she was like, can God choose someone else? And Mordecai said, yeah. Yeah, I could preach a sermon about that. God can and God will use someone else if he has to. But who knows whether he has called you to such a time as this. To such a time. Time is valuable. To someone who is, I can only imagine, Bob doesn't have to imagine it, he experienced it, but to someone who is having major heart failure, if that's me, I can only imagine my prayer being, Lord, revive my heart, give me more time. Please lift me off of this hospital bed, lift me off of this operating table, give me more, revive me, Lord. Oh, that our spiritual heart would cry out, Lord, revive me now. I'm not going to wait any longer. I've had the gospel message preached to me too many times for me to reject it again. No matter what I'm dealing with, God, I know you can revive your work. I can't do it. If, if it's in my work, I'll never get out of this situation, but you can revive it. And revive it now in the midst of the years. There's more to say on that. I'm going to get to the next one. And make it known. Not just the urgency, but, but the, this is the joy. This is the joy of this prayer. Make it known to all what your work is. Make it known in the midst of the years, Lord. Not only revive it, but let it be inescapable inescapably demonstrated who you are about your glory, your grace, your mercy as we get to here soon. It's by making the gospel known that mankind is saved. How are they going to hear without a preacher? And how are they going to preach unless they're sent? And sent by the power and the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Lord, make your work known through me, through us. Revive 
your work in the midst of the years and make it known in the midst of the years. It's through the praises of the people of God that his work is made known to the nations, isn't it? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. In the next slide, in wrath, remember mercy. This is a powerful statement. If you remember what I said already, the context of this prayer is judgment is coming. And the word of God says that judgment begins here at the house of God. Oh, Lord, your wrath has been kindled. Yes, there are so many things that have been abandoned through spiritual apathy and laziness and ignorance and, and on and on. Oh, Lord, revive us. Revive your people in wrath. The Lord's wrath has been kindled against sin, against rebellion, against stubbornness, against our work in his name. God has revealed his wrath against his people's rebellion and failure to follow his commandments. Galatians 6, 7 through 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Don't be deceived. Whatever you sow... In the ground, that's what the ground's going to produce. And if you sow stubbornness, rebellion, you're going to reap rejection. You're going to reap wrath from God. But, praise the Lord, in, in this fearful state that the, the prophet hears God's word clearly, he says, in wrath, Thank you, Father, that you are the God of mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. Listen to Lamentations 3, 21 through 26. This I recall, therefore I have hope. Though the, excuse me, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Because his compassion fail not. His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. This is what I recall to mind. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. If it was not for God's mercy, his wrath would consume us. But praise God, Scripture says... Mercy triumphs over judgment. Through his mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Hear what James says. I already mentioned it, but hear the context. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is, is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Psalm 85, mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and, and peace have kissed. Oh, mercy. God is a God of mercy. And when we say, Lord, revive your work, we have to understand that the work of God, there is wrath. But praise God. When his wrath is kindled, get Guess what his wrath is kindled so hotly against with his people? The enemy that is seeking to destroy us. And when his people turns, turn to him and says, Lord, revive your work. We yield to you, Lord. It's not about us anymore. Revive your work in the midst of the year. Then in his mercy, his wrath turns against the one who hates us, the enemy of our soul, and the wrath of Almighty God rescues, redeems, restores his children, and crushes the work of Satan. 
Establish the work of our hands, Psalm 90. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Yes, our hands do have to work, but it's the work that he gets us to do because it's his first. He's the light of the world, but he says, now you're the light of the world. He says, this is the work that you believe in him who he sent. And then he says, now you go into all the nations and you teach them the ones who to believe in and how to follow me. Satisfy us early with your mercy. Oh, in wrath, remember mercy. I want to make this a personal word today. Lord, I, I have heard your speech. Can you pray this personally? Pray this prayer. And if you can't, you know, where, you know where, the, where the work has to take place right now. Lord, I have heard you speak today to me. And I've been made afraid. I'm in awe of you, Lord. Oh, Lord, revive your work in me in the midst of these years. In the midst of these years, make it known in and through me. In wrath, Lord, remember me and your mercy. Can you pray that? The book of Habakkuk, the chapter, ends with this last line. And I'm just going to read it and just let it, let it revive us in this sermon we've looked at. Though the fig tree may not blossom nor fruit be on the vine. Though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food. Though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet and he will make me walk on my high places. To the chief musician, Extreme reverence. The Lord is my joy. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my deliverance. The Lord is my revival. This is how the, the prophet can say, in wrath, remember mercy. This is how the prophet can say, revive your work in the midst of the years and make it known because he knows that even if the fig tree doesn't blossom, even in the spring, if the springtime isn't what it's supposed to be, and there's no, nothing new happening. And then the summer comes, and there's no fruit. And then in the fall, the olive, the strength of the olive fails, the labor of the olive. And in the winter, there's no food whatsoever. No matter what season of life, even if there's no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice. There is rejoicing in this New Year resolution. When you can pray, revive your work in me in the midst of the years. Revive your work in your church. Revive your work in Bandon. Revive your work in my marriage. Revive your work in my fill in the blank. Then there is rejoicing because God is the God of revival, and he never fails. God never fails. We're going to take communion, but I wanted to, there's an old hymn, I was going to have us sing it, but you're going to have to bear with me. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love. For Jesus, who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Some of you know it. Sing with me. We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of light. 
who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for the joy thou hast given to the saints in communion, these foretaste of heaven. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. One more. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. That's my New Year resolution. I can't wait to see the further, the furtherance, the advancement of the work of God, the advancement of his kingdom here in the midst of our years. Amen. We're going to take communion. Communion is saying, this is the work of God that we believe in him. And when I take this bread and when I drink this cup, I'm testifying to the work, the eternal, once for all work of God that saved my soul and is able to save all mankind if they would just come and humble themselves and believe. His body, his blood, Offered for me communion. I have sweet communion. That word popped up in this verse here. Communion with the Father through Jesus Christ. Revive us, Lord. Even now as we take communion, it is all about his work. Salvation is his work. And we are his people. I'm going to pray. And then feel free to come up and take communion. Let's all do it together. We'll do it at the end. When I think everyone's ready. Lord, please bless this time. And, and by bless this time, Lord, I ask that. That means that we use this time. To receive your blessing. Oh, God. We started off by saying, have we heard you speak to us? If any heart has heard your speech to their heart. And has understood that your work is not being accomplished in their life. Oh, revive them, Lord, right now. Oh, draw them to true, sweet communion right now in the midst of this hour, this very minute. Oh, Lord, give them boldness, even in their fear of crying out to you. In wrath, remember mercy. Revive every heart here that needs your salvation. And for, for anyone here, Lord, that needs to be awakened to your work rather than theirs, revive them, Lord. Oh, God, we testify to your death, and we testify to your resurrection, and that you're coming again as we take this communion, Lord, in Jesus' name.
Jesus' name, let's take the bread. Praise the Lord. He is coming back. And the work he's accomplishing now will one day be fully completed. And oh, that there is such a sweet work to happen right now in this moment. Would you stand? The Lord, send us out with your power, with your purpose, with your work on the forefront of our mind. Thank you, God, that against you no enemy can stand. May we stand with you, confident, bold, revived. In Jesus' name, amen.